After years of speculation and countless theories, Betty Ting, Bruce Lee's former partner, has finally spilled the beans. From drug overdoses to murder plots and even ancient curses, people have wondered endlessly about what really happened to the martial arts legend. It might sound too philosophical, but it's unacting, acting, or acting, unacting. If you... You've lost me. <laughs> <laughs> I have, right? But now, brace yourselves as we delve into Betty Ting's shocking revelations about the untimely demise of Bruce Lee. It was the 20th of July, 1973. It was the pinnacle of Bruce Lee's career. Warner Brothers had offered him multi-picture agreements, and Hanna-Barbera had proposed an animated series based on his biography. He had just finished writing a letter to his attorney outlining the rich offers that were streaming in. These were significant landmarks that he was eagerly anticipating. The world seemed to be Bruce Lee's oyster. With the letter completed, he departed from his lavish estate and made his way to Golden Harvest Studios, where he had a meeting with George Lazenby, the Australian actor famous for his James Bond roles. Additionally, the only individual speaking English well in the area was Andre Morgan. They planned to include Lazenby in the current project, Game of Death. The three of them spoke about the complexities of filmmaking during their brainstorming meetings and in casual conversation. Bruce dropped by Raymond Chow's office for a quick visit after the studio tour to discuss bringing Lazenby on board with the project. Bruce was quick to accept to Chow's suggestion that they close the transaction over dinner. But Bruce changed his mind and decided to take a break from his hectic schedule by spending the day in Betty Ting's place. He promised to come back later to seal the sale. After that, Bruce went to Betty's warm apartment, where they spent a lot of time together. Pretending to be Bruce's fiance, Betty reminisced about their intimate times together, when they both indulged in hashish. As they became closer, Bruce told Betty how much he was looking forward to the project, and even suggested she play a romantic interest, a proposal she was hesitant to accept because she was worried it would reflect poorly on their real-life relationship. Raymond Chow's unannounced visit to Betty's flat as night fell cast doubt on his motives. At the same time, Bruce complained of feeling sick, clearly affected by the hot heat, far over 90 degree F, and high humidity, 84%. Chow departed for supper, but Bruce remained in Betty's care since his health worsened, despite their best attempts to help him. A succession of frantic phone calls and a last-ditch effort to save Bruce's life ensued shortly after, when Betty discovered him motionless on her bed. Bruce stayed still on the mattress through it all, and no one could figure out what had transpired. Looking at the dead body of Bruce Lee, the legend of martial arts movies, in his mistress's apartment, Raymond realized the seriousness of the situation. Raymond and Betty's jobs and reputations were on the line, so naturally, this also brought controversy and uncertainty. So that those left behind would not be destroyed by Bruce's tragic demise, Raymond saw the critical necessity to alter the storyline. Raymond hurriedly straightened Bruce's clothes in the poorly lit flat while he considered taking Bruce's corpse home or to the hospital. Every choice had repercussions, but Raymond was aware he needed to move quickly to lessen the public's shock. Betty was told to contact her doctor, Dr. Eugene Chu, when he finally decided to use medical aid. As soon as Dr. Chu showed there, Bruce's condition became clearly apparent. Bruce Lee remained motionless with a weak pulse and no longer breathing, despite heroic attempts to revive him. The doctor felt the gravity of the situation when he learned that Bruce had died only moments before he arrived. Dr. Chu, ignoring requests for privacy, contacted an ambulance pretending to help a distressed patient while concealing important information in order to avoid public criticism. Raymond told Betty to be quiet and tell Bruce's wife, Linda, in a low voice as the ambulance wound its way through the streets. Unaware of the reality that lay ahead, Linda made a beeline for the hospital. Medical staff at Queen Elizabeth Hospital immediately sprang into action upon the ambulance's arrival, trying to revive Bruce. Nobody could figure out why Bruce's heart wouldn't speak despite their best attempts. Reports of Bruce's death began to circulate across the city just after 11.30 a.m. as reporters scrambled to get whatever details they could get their hands on. The events were clouded by rumors that circulated. Brandon Lee, Bruce's son, answered the phone in the middle of all the chaos, oblivious to the tragedy that had befallen his family. He was eight years old. 
Raymond called his wife quickly, pleading with her to save them from the tumultuous situation, realizing that the media would be going ballistic any second. Raymond hid Linda at the house of Dr. Langford since he knew Bruce's house would be the target of investigation. A last goodbye to her husband's dead body was Linda's demand, as she drew strength from his soul and mentally prepared herself for the trip ahead as a widow and a mother, overcome with sadness. Police arrived at Betty's residence signaling the beginning of a thorough investigation. Because she was too distraught to ask any questions on Bruce's whereabouts while she was with her family, Betty stayed still. In order to change the setting of Bruce's death from Betty's flat, carefully constructed false narratives were used. Raymond, ostentatiously worried, escorted Linda to Dr. Langford's residence, where she fought against the inevitable scrutiny of the media. In the middle of all the chaos, she sought Dr. Langford's advice, wanting to protect Bruce's legacy from the slander that may ruin his reputation. As the evening progressed, Raymond and Linda remained seated, together devising a plan to maneuver through the media frenzy. Andre Morgan became involved at Golden Harvest, where they set out to repair the damage by making comments that would satisfy the Chinese and English media. As they strolled around their garden with Linda, they painstakingly constructed a narrative that depicted Bruce's death as a terrible accident. At the same time, the official diagnosis was issued by Queen Elizabeth Hospital, which said that Bruce had died of severe cerebral edema. However, the exact reason was not revealed. Their shared goal of protecting Linda and the children from unnecessary suffering and continuing Bruce's legacy led them to fabricate a tale that temporarily concealed the reality. The false story of Bruce Lee's death persisted for three days, shielding the public from the incessant reporting of the media. But underneath the calm surface, a tempest of rumors was gathering and the truth would soon come to light. An account from Betty Ting. Betty Ting's family tree goes back three generations of distinguished physicians and historical leaders in her Taiwanese hometown. She was born in 1947 into a prominent family. At the tender age of 21, she took a leap into the film industry and joined the Shaw Brothers studio in Hong Kong. She made her film debut there in 1967's The Purple Shell, playing the role of an enchanting dance hostess. She quickly became famous in Japan, where she appeared in several musical extravaganzas like The Millionaire Chase, 1969, and The Yellow Muffler, 1972, directed by a master of Japanese cinema. She proved her mettle in a variety of dramatic and comedic parts, but her romantic drama roles and sultry bedroom scenes catapulted her to stardom. But in 1972, when she was staying at a Hong Kong hotel with film producer Raymond Chow and Bruce Lee's wife, Linda Emery, her life took a dramatic change. Ting became entangled in Lee's life, which blossomed into a deep bond. Since Ting and Lee shared a dedication to being truthful and genuine, she will remember Lee with affection as an honest and upright guy. However, their growing closeness was overshadowed by rumors and suspicion over their affair. However, her nightmare of decades-long scrutiny and guilt began on July 20, 1973, when she found Bruce Lee deceased on her bed. In an interview given in 1983, she voiced her anguish about the rumors surrounding his death and stressed how unjust the charges made against her were. She was caught in the middle of a maelstrom of scandal and suspicion even though she denied any participation in his dying. Lee and Chow met in her apartment to talk about the game of death, according to Ting's version of what happened before Lee died. Nonetheless, she offered Lee a pain reliever when he complained of a headache. Shortly after that, he went to her room to rest for a while, but he didn't make it. Her mental health suffered greatly as a result of the unjustified accusations leveled against her and the abrupt death of her close friend causing her years of anguish and suffering. As she reflected on his deteriorating health and the months leading up to his death, she discussed the strain that Lee's strenuous training had placed on his body. In the face of adversity, he never wavered in his determination to test his physical limitations, even turning to extreme measures like high voltage stimulation. She was already grieving following his death and the constant barrage of allegations and threats made her feel even more vulnerable. 
As a result of her severely affected mental health, she married in 1976 after enduring a long battle with schizophrenia. Their marriage may have been short-lived, but it spared her life. Quietly devoted to finding inner peace and spiritual satisfaction via Buddhism, she withdrew from the entertainment world in the 1980s, seeking sanctuary from the harsh limelight of fame. After Bruce Lee's death, investigator Xu Chao dug more into the matter and became suspicious of Golden Harvest's story, setting in motion a protracted search for the truth. With unwavering resolve, the journalist dove into the medical records of Hong Kong and quickly found incriminating proof. The carefully constructed facade that Raymond and Linda had wanted the public to believe was broken when, within two days, he discovered a revealing entry in the ambulance log. Bruce Lee's pickup destination was Betty Ting Pei's house, not his own. Scandal sheets heightened the debate in Hong Kong's media landscape, which included four English daily and 110 Chinese periodicals. The venomous mosquito press wasted no time jumping on the discovery, setting the internet ablaze with conjecture. Witnesses from the neighborhood who spoke to Bruce's regular visits quickly demolished Betty's attempts to keep up the pretense that she supported the false story in every way she could. A new story would take shape as a result of careful selective disclosure, all in an effort to save his image and spare Linda and the kids any pain. A fresh, updated version of events transpired, addressing indisputable facts while denying risque rumors. The goal of this well-coordinated operation was to shield Betty and Raymond from legal trouble while also honoring Bruce's memory as a kind family guy. An average day was interrupted by an unexpected catastrophe in the updated chronology, which was painstakingly created to exonerate Betty of any wrongdoing. In her last conversation with Bruce before they parted ways, Linda described his painstaking work on a screenplay. Raymond presented himself as Bruce's associate in business, highlighting the platonic nature of his connection with Betty while describing a typical meeting between the two. Still, Bruce's health would deteriorate throughout the night, leading up to a last-ditch request for medical attention. Unexpected results would emerge from the autopsy on Bruce Lee's death. Examination revealed no signs of foul play, but it did reveal abnormalities, organ congestion, and cerebral edema. All signs pointed to acute cerebral edema as the killer, but no one could pinpoint what set it off. There were lingering traces of cannabis and the analgesic pill in Bruce's system, leading to suspicions of drunkenness. According to the doctor's consultations with respected colleagues, cannabis intoxication was proposed as a likely cause, implying the possibility of a negative response or a lethal overdose. Bruce Lee, a revered figure in Kung Fu, was considered a corrupting Western import in a colony that had just confiscated enormous amounts of heroin, morphine, and opium. When Bruce's marijuana usage was sensationalized by newspapers, a scenario involving drugs and deceit surrounding his premature death was created and the controversy exploded. After being cast as the femme fatale, Betty was subjected to unrelenting scrutiny due to the press's fabrication of stories about Bruce's alleged affairs with other actresses, which turned him from a revered figure in martial arts into a scandal. On top of that, the press stoked desires of being assassinated by Japanese kung fu masters or killed by envious fans drawing parallels to Bruce's past film adventures. At the same time, sensationalized stories of drug overdoses and orgies spread, making it difficult to tell fact from fiction. Later, however, word got out that a tabloid reporter had paid a substantial sum, $1,500, to a morgue beautician to take pictures of Lee's dead corpse. Photos from Bruce Lee's burial in the morgue showed his swollen face, among other disturbing features. And these photos stoked a fire of conspiracy theories. It was thought by some that Bruce had been poisoned because of the bloating. The more ordinary explanation suggested by Andre Morgan was that the deformation was the result of poor embalming techniques. As the events unfolded, Betty was subjected to unrelenting press scrutiny which made her consider extreme actions. Legal action against the tabloids was explored since she felt threatened by an onslaught of negative reports. 
But things were about to become much worse for her. Student accusations that she was Lee's killer and bomb threats in Hong Kong added fuel to the fire of the speculation that she was involved in Lee's killing. Violence like the tumultuous Marxist riots of 1967, which had shook the city, hung over the area. In response to the growing possibility of civil disobedience, the colonial authorities launched an exhaustive inquiry into Bruce Lee's death in an effort to ascertain its cause. Public unease was rooted in recollections of previous unrest. For example, the 1967 riots began as a peaceful labor dispute but quickly became violent, endangering British rule over Hong Kong. Many pro-British politicians, journalists, and police personnel lost their lives because extreme Chinese communists had really placed explosives all around the city. Amid all this media attention, Linda Lee was distraught and surrounded by reporters as she begged them to stop talking about Bruce's death. On the contrary, the inquiry was clouded by allegations of foul play and cover-up, which only served to heighten the tension. Miscommunication and accidents beset Golden Harvest's efforts to get Bruce's remains to Seattle for the funeral, adding fuel to the fire of superstition and conspiracy suspicions. Even if Betty wasn't directly engaged, she may have been a pawn in the deadly game of the triads, infamous criminal groups renowned for their vicious methods, according to certain whispers among the explanations surrounding Bruce's murder. A cloud of suspicion had descended onto Lee's every connection due to his history of interactions with these criminals, which had stoked conjecture. According to another account, Bruce met his untimely demise as a direct result of his unwillingness to pay protection money to the Hong Kong triads during filming. This story twisted reality into a narrative of revenge and extortion. Rumors swirled in mainland China about gangs plotting Bruce Lee's assassination, fearing his Cantonese films threatened their interests. Raymond Chow, his business partner, faced scrutiny amid speculation of a troubled relationship and a plot to profit from Lee's death. The release of Game of Death fueled suspicions further. Some suggested Chinese Kung Fu masters or a family curse behind Lee's demise. The touch of death method was central to these theories, linking to Bruce's family history. Yet, Bruce's brother Robert and son Peter's experiences contradicted the curse's supposed effects. The most recent theory centered on what killed Bruce Lee. Brain swelling was always known to be the cause of Bruce Lee's death, but additional information came to light from medical studies. Spanish renal experts have revealed a disturbing theory. Bruce Lee may have died at the age of 32 due to kidney failure. The report delved into Lee's medical history, illuminating his susceptibility due to several risk factors and a medical condition marked by an extremely low blood sodium level. A dangerous chain reaction had begun with Lee's stated usage of marijuana, which increases thirst, and his strenuous lifestyle, which fuels chronic fluid consumption. The tragic events that unfolded may have been influenced by the prescription he had taken for anxiety and discomfort. An awful scenario was conjured up by the experts. Bruce Lee had died from a particular kind of renal failure, a deadly failure to excrete excess water from his body, upsetting the delicate equilibrium of water in his system. Brain edema in his death may have resulted from this imbalance if it had gone untreated. Theories abound about what happened to Bruce Lee, and no one has ever been able to determine for sure if it was due to his heavy water consumption or some other factor. 